first of all before we look at the role uh, of science in economy relationship between science and economy etc let's take a look at what is science and what is economy and it might appear very elementary to you all uh, but let's just take a quick look at what is science now before we get into what is science let's look back a little bit at history of humankind humankind is an amazing amazing uh, you can say part of nature is an amazing species i was just looking at uh, some population data in the last 75 years that is from independence to today population of india has grown four times more than four times actually 4.2 times and uh, i do not think there is any parallel i mean biologists can correct me if i'm wrong that i do not think there is any parallel uh, with any other species in the world which has multiplied four times in the last 75 years in its uh, numbers so how has it been possible that one species has multiplied and obviously it is flourishing that is why it is multiplying it is not getting destroyed though there is the cycle of life and death for all species as individuals but as a species we have grown tremendously four times in 75 years i assume that is more or less the number for the world uh, population as well of human beings so what is it that makes human being special compared to all the rest of the species first of all human beings are extremely weak physically very weak i mean you can't compare uh, uh, the speed of a cheetah the leopard or the or the uh, strength of an elephant uh, or or uh, the venom that a uh, cobra has or any other you know uh, animals which they have the defense mechanisms to fight their uh, predators who are ready to attack them so human being is is very weak actually compared to all uh, rest of the mammals leave aside other things other animals still he is flourishing and multiplying and what if you look at it what distinguishes human being what has caused this growth this tremendous growth in the human kind i am just talking numbers the quality of life etc etc are are concomitant with this growth that the what distinguishes human being is the development of his brain and what is residing in that brain the activity of the brain which we call consciousness broadly and this consciousness reflects itself in in number of activities it is uh, curiosity it observes things there is cognition it observes things and then from observation repeated observation it it can correlate and come to a conclusion which is which is what we call inference for example i mean in classical indian philosophy they talk about the connection between fire and smoke so if a human being observes that there is smoke when 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 there is fire in the kitchen there is smoke okay this is obviously they are referring to old kitchens when they were burning uh, wood and not uh, modern lpg cylinders or cng pipe gas connection so in those days when you when you light a fire with using uh, wood you used to get smoke so if you look at there is a connection between smoke and fire from this the, the brain can grasp that there is a connection between smoke and fire so when that same human being sees that smoke somewhere else coming from a forest far away behind a hill then he says oh there must be fire there that means there is a tremendous amount of generalization the human brain has done by that time not only he has connected that the relationship between smoke and fire that if there is smoke there must be fire there okay it is not necessary that that if there is fire there has to be smoke but if there is smoke then there must be fire so but at the same time 
on what basis does he did he come to this conclusion or inference this is called inference in philosophy that is because his brain has already generalized smokeness that means whatever smoke he has seen he thinks the same smoke is coming from what uh, from uh, the forest behind the mountain so he generalized smoke and he generalized fire he might have seen one fire and one smoke in his kitchen or somewhere in a campfire but there he connects it relates it to something some other phenomenon some other smoke coming from somewhere else and he says there must be fire it could be it could be a volcano a smoke coming out of a volcano and he says oh there must be fire inside that so this is what we call as inference so human brain exhibits this curiosity to find out things to know things to understand things and it uses these using its sense organs all the sense organs it observes and then correlates and uh, infers and it also very early i am talking about early man i am not talking about today and of course it carries on today in a much more developed uh, fashion you can say that the human beings could also start connecting cause and effect that this leads to that so sometimes one cause leads to an effect sometimes multiple causes lead to an effect so this causality what is called causality cause effect relationship is another fantastic thing that the human beings observed all around them and that is how they try to make sense of what is going on around them if you don't have cause and effect if you cannot connect causes with and effects then it looks chaotic then 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 you know anything can happen any time or anything can lead to anything so trying to make sense trying to make sense out of the environment they discovered cause effect relationship and a cause effect relationship naturally leads to okay then so, something you know the you, the mind tries to model what could be happening which which is leading to an effect so uh, 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 human mind starts modeling a phenomenon it could be uh, a lightning it could be rain it could be a volcano it could be a forest fire it could be simple effect that if you heat if you uh, put a um, vessel with water on on top of a fire then it you know it it heats up and then might turn into steam or if you are living in a cold country then ice melts into water and so on and so forth you know everyday phenomenon then the mind also starts wondering why is this happening why is change happening and first of all it sees change all around it that constantly the world around us is changing and this very early human beings realized it and even philosophized about it in fact in in the, in the upanishads they talked about the meaning of jagat we say jagat means world but in in the upanishadic sanskrit jagat means that which is constantly changing so this change they observed change which which in fact if you look at it it is change which gives us the concept of time if nothing changed then there is no time there is no before and after because people could see change in nature all around them not only in themselves that their growth etc but all around them that they said oh this is before and that is after okay so concept of time and distance and so on so all these things people could experience and also model and theorize and this and uh, this trying to model and then understand what is going on okay that model may be wrong but the it might prove to be wrong later but it is it's what the mind comes up with initially after seeing few things or oh, this is what must be happening but then from that model you come to certain conclusions certain predictions and uh, if those predictions don't come true or something else totally totally different thing happens then of course you might wonder whether your model is right or wrong and somebody else can come up with a different model and say no 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 that's not what is happening this is what is happening and so on okay so there is a contention of models contention of ideas 
and it, this is what we start calling as theory that okay that not only uh, in this phenomena this is happening and in that phenomenon that is happening and in a third phenomenon something else have, is happening but can we bind them all together in one in one formalism under one underlying in one we using one underlying theory can we explain all or most of these phenomena and so from model we go to uh, what we call as a theory which is which is something as uh, uh, a systematic uh, formalism which can explain multiple phenomena not just one phenomena okay so this is what has been going on from very very early early uh, development of mankind um and uh, along with that another very important feature of human beings physical which combines his physical as well as his mental characteristics is making tools okay that he develops he starts using elements of nature around him to help him do something better what physically he can or cannot do this tool will help him to do better for example i mean you have seen primitive uh, you know which some of these practices survive in certain communities uh, in uh, certain remote areas and so on how do you catch fish how do you uh, you know um, uh, hunt how do you cut something so and of course uh, archaeologists tell us now that uh, say even in karnataka if you see uh, in the deccan plateau they have found many many uh, uh, areas in the krishna region bhima region etc where tens of thousands of years ago you can see stone implements which were made by early man and these stone implements these stone weapons these stone knives even some of them were uh, uh, sharp enough to even shave some archaeologists tell us okay so they were all made out of stones so this is the part of the stone age uh, development of uh, man so that means what he could not do with his fingers with his nails with his hands and legs he started using these tools to do that added to his uh, power his uh, his uh, ability to uh, first of all uh, get better food or more food and so on so uh, uh, then of course we have seen how this led to this observation inference etc slowly led to man growing his own food now if you see there is no other species in this uh, in on this earth which creates its own food which can sow something and grow more out of it okay they all they all have predators and prey they have something to eat but they cannot multiply what they are eating it is human beings through agriculture and fisheries to some extent um, only developed fisheries where they started actually multiplying fish otherwise they were just uh, whatever fish was abundant in nature in the streams and in the rivers and oceans that uh, they they caught and uh, consumed uh, and uh, the, the importance of fishery on which you know crores of uh, uh, people in india depend on livelihood etc i mean you some other time you can ask uh, dr ramesh uh, to give you a talk he is an expert his phd is in fisheries now uh, uh, this uh, uh, this is what is amazing about human kind if you compare it to all other species now let's look at now move ahead now this human brain this human brain perceives two worlds it lives in two worlds there is an outer world that outer world is something which is uh, not under its control what is happening in the outer world is not under its control so it it can say this is me and that is the other okay that is outside of me so it could be plants animals rocks uh, and it can even be a society the other rest of the human beings uh, the rest of the uh, you know um, which we call society so this how we deal with this outer world whether it is human beings and so society or it is non human that is it could be plants it could be rocks it could be anything else uh, 
um, animate or inanimate that we call as outer world. So in this case, it is somewhat uh, easier to study this because it is something outside of us. Because to study something, you have to convert it into an object which you can observe. Okay, that's why it is very difficult to study ourselves because how do we separate ourselves from our nature? If we want to understand our nature, that's why we call it subjective because the subject is trying to understand uh, itself, himself or herself. That is very, very difficult. Okay, uh, so it's very difficult to convert yourself into an object which you can study. Your emotions, your feelings, you know, your behavior, etc. But something outside of you, outside of your consciousness, uh, is much easier to study. So that is what I, I call as outer world. So science, philosophy, you know, uh, all these things develop to understand this outer world. Then there is inner world, which is the world of experiential world, world of emotions, intuition, dreams, etc. These, uh, uh, this is another world. Now, normally, aesthetics, you know, something you like, something, uh, some sound you hear, you like that, you call that music. You do not call all no sound as music, only certain sound as music and pleasing. You find only certain smells pleasing. So all these certain forms, certain dances, certain movements, etc. So this is uh, what broadly one calls as aesthetics. What gives you pleasure? What gives you? What elevates your mood, etc., etc. Okay, or affects your mood. It can be sad thing also, of course, something which can uh, take you back to sad memories. Okay, and so on. This is what. In Indian uh, in uh, Indian uh, uh, philosophy and history, they called it as rasas, rasanubhava. Okay, that how do you how do you connect yourself to a certain emotion and so on. But this is all internal. I mean, this is very difficult to uh, observe and theorize about these things. So normally, though there are attempts to understand uh, emotions, uh, um, neurology, psychi psychology, psychiatry, and all these things, try to deal with some of these things. But uh, the, the, without trying to understand it, there are other uh, aspects of human endeavor, like art, like literature, like uh, performing arts, like theater and uh, dance and so on, that which try to express this and touch these emotions, enhance them, and uh, you, we say it touched our heart, right? Because of course the common feeling is emotions uh, uh, are located in the heart. Though uh, a doctor or a physiologist will tell you that's not true. All emotions and thoughts reside in the brain and the heart is just a pump to pump the blood. But that is a scientist's view, a physician's view. But uh, the general understanding was that it is in the heart that all these emotions and other things reside. Okay, so it is that is a world of what we call humanities, arts and humanities, which touch the inner world. Whereas this outer world is what we we say when we are studying nature, we call it natural science, and when we are uh, uh, looking at society of human beings, we call it social science. Okay, and so natural science, of course, I mean, everything in nature, it's the earth, the oceans, the atmosphere, plants, animals, even minute things called microbes. Today, after all, we are all being affected by a microbe, a virus called Corona and so on, right? Study of all these things because these are all external to us and we want to study this. We want to understand it. We want to use it. We want to protect ourselves from it. So for our security and for prosperity, this understanding we try to use, okay? So similarly, physics deals with matter, its structure, motion, properties of matter, energy, how does matter and, uh, you know, my, how do matter and energy interact among them and so on. So this is a way it tries to understand the physical world, which is inanimate world. It's not, it's not dealing with animate, that is the life. Neither is it trying to understand consciousness. Is trying to understand inanimate matter. And then when we see, I mean, you know, another aspect of matter, which is that 
two things when they come into being, they produce a third thing, which is very different from the first two, right? This is what we learn in school chemistry, right? There is something called chemical change. Sodium and chlor uh, chlorine are both, you know, literally poisonous elements, but they combine to produce sodium chloride, which we eat every day, right? And we need it. Not only we eat it, but without it, we can't survive. Uh, without salt, uh, human beings cannot survive. And a physician will tell you, oh, sodium ions, these electrolytes are very important to maintain the various uh, aspects of the blood uh, and blood pressure and so on and so forth, right? It's, that's why we, without uh, salt, we cannot, uh, we cannot survive, okay? Uh, so that is a, a school level example of what is meant by chemical change and chemical properties and so on. So the chemistry deals with these, these interactions between different forms different forms of matter, different uh, types of matter, which are called elements, compounds, and so on and so forth. So they deal with all these things. And similarly, you know, um, um, uh, outer world also implies what is in the skies, what we call a celestial, celestial world. That is a celestial objects, stars. Then the people started calling them stars, planets, comets, uh, you know, meteors, and so on and so forth, right? And then there is, materials like you can classify everything in that glass glass beads were found in very early uh, ceramic beads glass beads have been found in very early in Mohenjo-daro harappa and and uh, even uh, you know so uh, these beads were used at that time similarly if you see Mohenjo-daro uh, some of the artifacts which have been recovered there is this uh, statue of a girl uh, you know standing very jauntily with a hand on her hip made up of bronze okay so that means they knew bronze and bronze is not naturally occurring. It's an alloy. You might know it's made up of copper and zinc and a little bit of tin. So they not only knew copper, zinc and tin, but they could make an alloy of it and make and even probably used casting to, to produce a, a, a nice yeah. little uh, statue. So this understanding of materials, different materials. Similarly, it is said that one of the ma main reasons why uh, Alexander could not cross the Indus and come into plains of India was uh, not just that his uh, soldiers were tired and so on and so forth, but Magad, which was facing him, which was a large empire at that time, even before the Mauryas, had already uh, the iron and uh, some types of uh, hard iron, you know, some types of steel technology. So it is said that he took back, uh, when he returned, uh, you know, uh, he took back uh, several pounds of this new material because the Greek, the Macedonian Greek army, which, uh, which uh, uh, he had collected to uh, conquer uh, Asia and so on, and had come here, they, were, they still had uh, bronze weapons, okay? And iron and steel are far more, far different materials, far stronger materials than bronze. So, uh, so Indian steel uh, was a highly uh, valuable material in the ancient world and medieval world. Um, so anyway, so what I'm trying to say is the study of materials, creating new materials, you know, first understanding the properties of materials that you, that are around you. And can we extract it from the ores? Can we smelt it? And can you, what do we do with those metals? You know, whether it is copper or iron or, or zinc, which is even more difficult. You know, zinc, uh, if you heat it a little bit, uh, little too much, it just vaporizes. Uh, okay, so uh, how do we even extract it out of our ore? Just by heating it, you will not get it. It will just become vapor and fly away. So even all these zinc smelting technology, for example, was mastered by ancient India uh, uh, and so on. So uh, the in the ancient world too, they had their own understanding of these materials and uh, these, uh, you know, uh, and and what to do with these materials, how to how to use them to to let us say make implements for agriculture, uh, make uh, various things. I mean, for example, we talk about agriculture, right? Agriculture uh, is itself uh, development of, uh, requires development of plant varieties, what we call crops. Now, almost all the cereals we, we, we eat in our diet today are actually based, they are grass seeds. So from wild grass seeds to domesticate them and develop varieties of hundreds of varieties of uh, rice and uh, 
jowar and bajri and ragi and so on so forth so many serials it took tens of thousands of years so it but it required human intervention they were not uh, you know um, naturally occurring so the bread and cross bread and so on and uh, several varieties so that is how agriculture evolved to better uh, grains uh, and more nutritious grains and more hardy grains which can grow with less water or who uh, the grains uh, or crops which are resistant to certain pests and so on and so forth so agriculture itself involved a lot of science and in fact recently one um, uh, historian pointed out in his talk uh, on a history of technology that uh, not only that that uh, we just take it for granted that uh, uh, tilling the land using a uh, uh, plow was a big development in agriculture okay from just using hands now you had a plow okay whether it initially it was it was a, a wooden plow and later once with the development of iron etc you got iron plow but somebody had to pull the plow now what what uh, i mean largely in the indian subcontinent we used ox right so but what is an ox ox is a creation of a great technology okay or as you know only i mean if people if any of you uh, come from rural areas you will be more familiar with it ox is a product of great understanding of reproductive biology and uh, uh, it is it is actually a castrated version of bull so that is a tamed version of the bull which means which is what today we learn in veterinary, veterinary sciences and animal husbandry so <laughs> literally thousands of years ago people in the subcontinent had understood that to the extent that they could domesticate a bull or to convert it to an ox and then yoke it to a to a um, uh, to a plow and then plow the land and that's how the agriculture world further i mean it is productivity increased tremendously so this increase making the art of making your own food and then inventing newer and newer implements to increase that production of food is what led to the population explosion so what we talk about four times increase in the last 75 years this wouldn't have happened if there was limited food and if we didn't know how to make food if we didn't have green revolution and so on and so forth various other developments that took place better seeds better fertilizers better ways of uh, uh, tilling you know better newer machines to help uh, human beings to do that irrigation and so on and so forth so a complex uh set of uh, technologies and uh, uh, science is what has led to even evolution of agriculture now um social science i mean when you because i said you can study nature you can also study society so that's what we call economics and political science and sociology anthropology linguistics i'm not going to go into it uh, today uh i'll try to restrict myself to natural science and this is the, and you can add many more in this uh is what we call as social science that is but what uh is common between natural science and social science is the method that is that last word which you call science in that two word name that is that is what uh, unifies natural science and social science which is a method and that method is what we are discussing earlier that is observation right uh or we can call it experiment because sometimes you can manipulate it it's under your control so that you call as experiment but sometimes you cannot like you can only observe a star you can observe only observe certain phenomenon you cannot manipulate a lightning you cannot manipulate a cyclone you can observe it right so by observation and sometimes by experimenting under controlled conditions and then looking at uh, then modeling it right and and then theorizing it and testing the theory verifying it it is that's how that is a scientific method and whether you apply it to nature or to society i mean it is a, a that is what makes it science okay now let's look at there is just a brief uh, uh, you know discussion about what how science and this human curiosity human observation human uh, um, evolution of uh, uh inference and modeling and theory has led to better understanding of nature and better prosperity for human beings now let's look at this other word in our title called the economy what is economy 
you know production of all the needs of mankind whatever we need whether we consider it as mankind or just a family or a individual how do we produce it and how do we distribute it okay that means how uh, how how do we give it to a, the the person who is consuming it that is what we call as economy study of this production how things are produced all that the human mankind needs mankind might need number of things depending on the level of development of society and may, may be clothing and shelter later the needs increase right so all those needs how they are produced and how they are conveyed to the consumer that is what is called the economy this complex but obviously this involves society this involves not an individual okay an individual suppose he is living in a hut in a you know in a remote uh, uh, place then he might try to survive and you know and he might have a small family and the family might try to survive by hunting gathering whatever and maybe even trying to grow some things here and there uh, right uh, now we see this this is what we call as primitive in primitive economy uh, it is characterized by what is called subsistence economy subsistence means let us say i have a small piece of land which is uh, fertile enough that i can grow things but then what i grow there can last me the whole year okay me me by me uh, i include my family close family who are also contributing their labor everything to to that growth uh, to growing those crops so then i more or less consume whatever i grow okay now if i need clothes then not only i have to grow cereals and etc whatever i need to uh, to sustain myself but then i'll have to grow a little bit of cotton then i'll have to spin it make a yarn out of it then i might have to you know uh, uh, mix uh, cloth out of it either knit it do whatever various uh, uh, ways to make a cloth out of that uh, that uh, yarn uh, right so this way of living this uh, economy is called subsistence economy that means the producer consumes the product okay now obviously this is very primitive because it's very difficult for one person to be and uh, to be a good farmer to be uh, not only good farmer but he has to grow multiple crops he has to grow cotton then he has to become a spinner then he has to become a weaver and so on and so forth right so for if he has to satisfy all his needs himself then he will not be good at uh, any of them the more he specialize and uh, learn one one uh, technique and one uh, trade properly the better, more efficient he will become so this is what le leads to division of labor that means there may be somebody specializing in in weaving and spinning and using cotton you know and developing textile then you say okay that person is is coming out with much better quality textile than what i would have done on my own struggling so let me get it from him but then what can you give give him in return that is something what you have grown so if you have something grown which is extra that is you have to first of all you have to produce surplus and that surplus you can exchange to get some other things which you need okay so that is the a little more advanced economy where there is exchange and that exchange also um, like exchange can take place in many forms it uh, it can be initially it can be in barter then it can be even uh, the development of money etc all this happened now interestingly in india even today you will find large number of very small farmers basically doing subsistence economy but that means the the land is so so small and the productivity is so low that all that they can do by working a few months is to uh, grow their own food more or less that's it okay they are not producing food to take it to the market and get some cash out of it and so on they can't so they then you know uh, in the off season that is non agricultural season they try to uh, work as laborers in other fields or in other uh, trades etc to earn a bit of cash because that, with that cash they can buy things which they cannot grow 
it could be uh, fuel, it could be uh, cloth, it could be a soap, it could be anything, you know, because all those things they're not producing, they have to buy it. To buy, you need money. To get money, you cannot go grow money, right? So you have to, uh, you have to sell your labor power and with that, as wages, you get money and with that money, you can buy other things. So that is a more advanced economy where there is exchange. Okay, and this exchange slowly evolved into markets and so on and so forth. And these markets are also fair trade and markets are very old. I mean, even in Mohanjadaro times, they have found uh, you know, that, that the, the people uh, residing in those Harappan uh, settlements were trading with, uh, with uh, regions which were outside uh, their uh, area. Because you find things which are not locally, locally produced. Then how did they come here? Because they were traded. Okay, so trade also uh, is uh, trade and exchange and uh, some sort of primitive markets, right? Uh, all these things came into being way back in the ancient world. Okay, now, uh, so study of all this production, distribution, and now we, of course we have fairly developed, uh, well developed markets. Even uh, India in the last 75 years has changed a lot, which was primarily an agricultural country, right? And uh, uh, now, uh, even in agriculture, we are using modern methods, modern seeds, modern implements, machinery, and uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, use of uh, labor, just hired labor, right? It's not just family labor. You have to hire labor, and if the labor is scarce, then you go for machinery and so on and so forth. So, there is automation, there is technology, and that is what is in today's agriculture, right? Now, let's come to from the generalities to the to the nature uh, of uh, indian economy now indian economy if you take a look at it today in uh, it is about 3 trillion dollars is what is uh, the size of our economy that is what is called the gross domestic product 1 trillion dollars is by today's exchange rate that is about roughly 75 rupees per dollar it is 75 lakh crores Okay, lakh crore is a concept which is difficult to uh, imagine, so it's easier to call it trillion. Okay, so uh, uh, a trillion dollars, uh, three trillion dollars is our GDP, which comes down to with our large population of 140 crores per capita of 2200 dollars. So, Indian economy by its size of three trillion is about sixth in the world. Okay, and this year, uh, maybe next year, we might become fifth. And a few years later, we can go up. But uh, while uh, that is a good sign, but it is important to know that we are still lagging behind many, many other countries, even much smaller countries and what appear to be much even um, weaker economies. Like today, even Bangladesh has per capita more income than us. Sri Lanka has been having more income than us much before that, okay? So that is why per capita income is what we need to increase. And even this per capita, which turns out to be $2,200, is actually, is roughly by today's exchange rate, 1,65,000 rupees, which means about 13,000 to 14,000 rupees per month income, per capita. But we know how many, uh, if you look around, how many people earn 14,000 rupees a month, month, uh, in the people surrounding you, very few, right? There are still large number of people who struggle. Maybe there may be one person in the family, even in city, large cities, one person in the family, maybe of three or four, maybe earning 10,000, 9,000, 8,000. There are people working for much less than that also in uh, various jobs and struggling to do. So that's why in such families, every member of the family tries to uh, make some, uh, take some job and earn something to contribute to the family's uh, kitty. Now, um, uh, so this is an average. So averages uh, do not, uh, you know, tell the picture about the uh, people who are living below that average. Because somebody who is a billion, multi-billionaire, for example, uh, is actually, um, when you average it with another person earning just a few rupees, the average looks very good. Okay. Now, so uh, that is why uh, constantly we want to increase the, the aim of our uh, economic policies 
should be to increase the per capita income. Now, if you look at the structure of our economy, there are three major components, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. And surprisingly, agriculture occupy, produces only 16% of our GDP. Now, when I call what I mean by agriculture, it is not just farming. It includes allied um, uh, activities as well. That is fisheries, dairy farming, poultry, animal husbandry, and so on. Okay. All of them together constitute about 16% of our economy. And manufacturing, all the factory produced goods, that is about 30%. That is, together, manufacturing and agriculture produce about 46%, less than half of our economy. And rest of it, more than 54%, comes from what, what is called services. And services is a, is a very broad category. That means anything which is not <laughs> based on agriculture or anything which is not produ producing something in a factory, that is, you can say, service. A service which is required. For example, you need power, you need a bus, you need a train, you need an airline, you need hospitals, you need uh, educational institutions, right? You need governance. You need the government and its uh, various arms and uh, working in the government, that is administration. You need defense, the army and uh, all its weaponry and, and so on, right? Navy, Army, Air Force. You need law and order machinery, that is the police, jails, courts, etc. Then you need professional services. That is, you know, you can say chartered accountant or a lawyer and so on and so forth. Even, even a barber or a beautician, all these come under services. Entertainment, we, we, we are, you know, after a hard day's work, we want to be entertained, we want to relax. We want to listen to music, we want to see a movie. Or, or, a, or a television program. So all those people who are involved in producing those things, they come in the service sector. Okay, so this is the structure of our economy. That is agriculture and allied, then manufacturing, then services. Now, as you can see, literally, every one of these things, everything around you involves technology. And that technology itself has been enhanced and further advanced through science. Because what is the difference between science and technology? Let's see. Science is basically understanding all aspects of nature. And if it is social science, all aspects of society. After, then, of course, we, we break it into more specialized fields. But we say botany, zoology, microbiology, right? Medicine, uh, engineering, and that too within engineering. 10 different streams of engineering and so on, right? Now, there is science, which understands nature. Then there is technology, where engineering and all these other subjects come, where we apply the understanding of nature to solve a problem, right? Now, we want, there is a, let us say, Brahmaputra River. Now, Brahmaputra River is like a ocean, literally. It's very difficult to see near Guwahati if you go there. Very difficult to see the other uh, other uh, end, other uh, banks of the uh, Brahmaputra. If you are standing on the one bank, the other bank is almost invisible. It's almost like an ocean. Okay. Now, if, how do we connect these two? That is a problem. If they have to go all around, you know, several hundred miles and so on, just to get to a place where it is very narrow and so on, so that you know, using a boat or something where the currents are not very high, you were using a boat to cross, that is one, one way, right? But if you want to, several miles you want to cover and connect them, then you have to build a bridge, right? So bridge building, which is the technology where you apply everything about constructing the bridge, all the science that you know about the soil, about the strength of the materials, about the strength of that structure, where all it needs support, Will it uh, withstand the current? Will it withstand the winds? And so on and so forth to design that bridge, then actually build it. Uh, generate the materials required for it, collect the materials required for it, and then build it, right? That is what is called technology. That is applying all the understanding of nature to solve particular problems, specific problems, okay? For example, in a sense, that uh, uh, understanding uh, the virus and how a virus works, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is science. But if you say, I want to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, right, then I want 
to multiply it. I want to produce it billions of these uh, vaccine vials so that the entire Indian population uh, can be vaccinated. Then you need technology for producing billions of uh, uh, vials of vaccine. Okay, so that there the problem is how do we protect uh, billions of people from this uh, pandemic? Now, but the study of that virus, its gene, and what is its you know how does it affect human gene and so on and so forth? Uh, what is the interaction between virus and human body and how can we protect themselves? That is science. That is done in laboratories, universities by scientists. But then. Where, uh, once they discover how these things work and how we can protect ourselves, then they transfer that knowledge to a mass production unit where they, they specialize in producing large quantity of that safely and uh, in a state where it can last uh, for uh, six months to a year at least so that it can be stored and used. Because many things are unstable, many of these things are unstable. You can produce it; it can uh, you can show that it works, but then you know next day it might uh, decompose. So all that comes under technology. So technology is 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 uh, 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 applying all our understanding to solve specific problems, right? So technology is what we see all around us in doing everything. As I talked about agriculture, you talk about fisheries, you talk about dairy farming. Every aspect of the our economy involves technology and it looks like science science is just understanding nature right understanding nature this looks like some philosopher you know trying to uh, understand uh, things and philosophize it and so on and so forth so it looks as if technology is all that we need right for after all our material prosperity our material society depends on technology so then why should we fund science why should we encourage science if it is just you know trying to understand nature this is a question many times it appears right so science there is a hesitancy there are questions raised about funding science and encouraging science so in this last slide i just want to say why it is necessary to encourage science and study science and uh, fund it because of finally uh, this is uh, this is like a sannyasi's activity okay in fact, these were the words used by Jamshedji Tata to Swami Vivekananda when he was discussing IIC uh, establishing Indian Institute of Science uh, with uh, Swami Vivekananda. Jamshedji said, you know, so activity of science is also like something of an ascetic. So you know, he was trying to, uh, anchor, uh, you know, uh, somehow convince Swami Vivekananda that he should lead this new Institute of Science which he wanted to establish. Okay, that Swami Vivekananda should lead this. Because as a sannyasi, he can very well lead the other sannyasis. So only he called scientists as sannyasis. Okay, just like sannyasis are looking at the various aspects of life and philosophy and uh, nature, etc., philosophizing it and uh, sacrifice all other things for that purpose. He said scientists are very similar. Okay, so the point is, first of all, many times technology. Uh, comes from primitive understanding of certain phenomena. For example, there are uh, uh, cave temples in Maharashtra where I uh, stay, uh, which are uh, more than 2000 years old, built in Shatavahana uh, times, that is second century BC to uh, third, fourth century uh, AD. These are cave temples built in, uh, say, uh, near Lonavala or uh, Mahad or Nasik and so on. So hard rock has been cut and inside the cave, so many temples have been built 2000 years ago. That means they knew the technology of cutting rocks. That means what kind of tools did they have to do that? What kind of materials did they have? We rarely look at that. We only look at uh, when you look at a historical thing, we just say who built it or when it was built, what was the date or was it built by a merchant or a rich man or a king or so on and so forth, right? Historians mostly look at it or look at the style style of the so-and-so uh, -so temple etc but what was the technology involved in doing it if you look at it so this technology even the if you even more ancient if you see look at mohenjadaro mohenjadaro used burnt bricks and interestingly mohenjadaro type of settlements covered more than a million square kilometers there are more than thousand sites many of them in pakistan and many of them in, in india even up to haryana 
Gujarat and uh, Rajasthan, we have found many, many Harappan sites, right? And some large, some small sites. Now, all of them used the same proportion in the bricks, that is 3 is to 4 is to 9. Who set this standard? How they learned this thing that burnt bricks are better than clay bricks, right? So, I mean, the, the, uh, all this, that means certain technologies develop just by trying to understand how very simply with simple modeling without any uh, deep understanding of the processes, or how, why it happened. They just saw that if we do this, this, this happens. So this is beneficial to us. Let's use it. Not why it happens. I mean, it doesn't tell you why if you heat a brick, burn a brick, that the burnt brick is better than the clay brick. What is the Sorry. internal process that makes a burnt brick better than a clay brick? Sure. Okay. Sure. So this comes with science. So science discovers, science is the basis. It systematizes technology as well as discovers new things. For example, from esoteric science of quantum physics, evolved of uh, and uh, understanding of, uh, say, the interaction of atoms and radiation, and Einstein understood it and wrote a paper in 1905, which led to lasers. Okay, totally new things. And lasers have done wonderful things. They not only they do, do your eye surgeries, they even uh, do all the welding. If you go to any automotive factory, even in India, you come to Dharwadi and you see Tata Motors factory, there are so many robots doing welding using lasers. So the, all this all came out of the fundamental developments in science. Okay, so... What I mean to say is, while technology is what we apply and use, science provides a basic understanding of uh, of the, the phenomenon. So that is what requires that for the growth of our economy, all aspects of our economy, agriculture, manufacturing, services, everything, we need science. We need to fund it. We need to encourage it. Thank you.